we're going to be talking um, about from virtual versus in person, shifting that language and having a conversation to is it virtual and in person? And so um, we have some slides to guide us through some thinking, but also to start a conversation into this um, topic that if you weren't interested in it prior to the pandem pandemic, you're probably now interested in it. So I'll go to the next slide here where there's a few slides that you'll probably be familiar with um, for all ECHO presentations. And that's to say that um, we don't have anything too exciting to disclose here, other than our research interests um, are supported by CHR. And the next slide um, says we, we don't make a lot of money from this topic either. Um, and then the next slide is to say that we are pre uh, presenting uh, work that is evidence-based. So, um, so over the last, uh, what, 18, 19, 20 months, I don't know how many months we're now into this, um, we've seen a massive increase in the use of virtual, in the use of digital um, to provide care. And that's uh, no news to anyone on this particular call. Um, and that's really partly to do with the fact that you can't get COVID through a screen, as far as we know. And so um, it's been touted as the digital PPE to provide virtual or digital uh, care. And there have been a lot of um, uh, surveys and uh, news articles that suggest that there's been this massive increase in the use of virtual care. So I presented just a couple of statistics here because um, I think this group is well aware of the massive increases, perhaps at your own organization as well. And so um, Canada Health InfoWay uh, provided a publication just earlier this year, a couple of months ago. Um, saying that 35% of all patient reported visits were virtual. Um, but if you look at what the physician said last fall, uh, at least 83% um, of physicians provided at least one virtual care uh, visit with some that are providing the majority of care through virtual and some that are providing a lot less. So obviously it, it's, it's, um, it uh, varies um, and it's, it varies per um, specialty area as well. And so if we go to the next slide here, uh, this is about, we've started to see some conversations some discussions about the reflections that people have had from a provider and patient perspective on a lot of things going virtual, virtual or digital over the uh, last uh, over a year. And so these are often in the form of perspective pieces or commentaries um, or editorials. And here are two on your screen that I wanted to share because they represent a lot of the discussions and conversations in this space. So the first one being, is there um, evidence that uh, certain kinds of care uh, can be provided effectively in a virtual or digital format? So there's lots of discussion about that and what should be in person, what should not be in person? Um, should there be periodic in-person visits? Um, the second conversation is all about these sort of stories of um, perhaps missed care or missed diagnoses uh, or assessments that folks feel haven't been fulsome. And the thinking behind that is if there was some sort of in-person care that a physical examination might have uncovered whatever it was. And so these are some of the kinds of conversations we tend to hear a lot these days. And so if we go to the next slide, Allison, the question is really what to do. Uh, so, you know, how much care should be digital or virtual? How much care should be in person? And it's um, what we hope to elicit from this conversation is that it's not so straightforward. There are lots of different um, components to this discussion. And what I thought I would do is provide a bit of a scenario that we could then, once we get to the next slide, which we're not going there yet, I'll provide this area scenario first. Uh, that we can use that scenario to reflect upon and think about what are some of the many considerations that um, uh, shape what kind of care is provided. And so if we think about um, a scenario where an individual may be living in a rural setting, perhaps in southwestern Ontario, and they're connected with, say, a geriatric psychiatrist in a large teaching hospital, perhaps in London, um, and that they're connected during the pandemic, they've done all their care virtually to date, all their assessments to date, 
The individual receiving care uh, in this scenario lives several hours from London and prefers to have a virtual visit. The provider does visits sometimes at home, sometimes in the clinic or at the hospital. And the individual's family members feel that at least periodically, the individual should go in for in-person care. And so that's probably not unlike a number of scenarios that we've come across. And so if we go to the next slide here, these are some of the kinds of considerations we start to think about. And I know Alice is gonna go into more depth here um, as, as we continue throughout the presentation, but what is the best evidence for approaching the particular clinical issue? Uh, what are some of the logistical considerations like transportation or geography or childcare? And of course, there's the pre preference of patients and clinicians and family members. But I, I, I want to stop here for a moment and perhaps you can enter in the chat um, before Allison takes it away to um, uh, show us decision support as well about some of the other considerations that you've come across or you might think about in the scenario that I've provided. So I will pause so you can think and reflect on that. I'm not seeing anything. Other folks, oh, finances, weather, yep, here they come in. Broadband, yes. Yeah, group versus individual sessions. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. So you get to, you're, we're starting to see here that it's uh, privacy, that there are, there's complexity to this. Population health considerations, mm -hmm. communication needs, visual cues. Okay, great. So this is, I think, the start of getting our brains into this discussion. And I'm going to pass it over to Allison, who's going to walk through some of this some more. Here's a little moment for everybody. Um, and just a reminder that, I mean, one of the reasons we're having this conversation, maybe some of us would have provided virtual care before the pandemic, and then we were forced into it. But we do all have an awareness that there's this gap between what we want technology to do and sometimes what it's like um, for, the, for the people who receive care through technology. Um, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit everybody. And um, you may know from the, the research literature that actually it's clinicians who tend to, we just did a big survey at CAMH looking interprofessionally at all the clinicians and their experience of virtual care and also uh, polling patients. And actually the patients tend to rate it higher than uh, their experience as you know being more satisfied than the clinicians do so i think sometimes as clinicians we're just aware of what it's what care is usually like in person we know more about therapeutic alliance and um and and also maybe to see 50 people a day virtually versus being one patient receiving care um, th that might be a different experience as well but anyway as we move forward and you know, individually, the choices that we make with patients and the choices that patients make, how do we weigh those as well with a system perspective? You know, right now we have this sort of fragmented system that worked, at least it kept us all going during the pandemic, but how do we kind of onboard so that people can receive a combination of in-person and virtual care? Um, so I'm gonna just really go, uh, like fly through these because I think that the highlights really were captured um, by the survey that Jillian talked about, but essentially most physicians are offering some form of virtual care. Although one thing that I think surprised a lot of people is a lot of that's happening by telephone. Um, and I know we had to rewrite our virtual care policies to make sure that we um, accounted for the fact that a lot of virtual care was happening by telephone, not necessarily televideo. And uh, and that family doctors are using it a lot more than specialists. So that's something else we have to uh, understand. Uh, but still in-person remains more, uh, more common than virtual care, even despite the pandemic. Um, 
this really says that we've touched on most of these patients were quite satisfied are quite satisfied overall and most would like to see some form of virtual care available to them going forward. Here were some of the, so this was a study through um, the, the Canadian Medical Association, 2,000 physicians, so, you know, a, a pretty, pretty good sized survey. And these were some of the barriers, Jillian asked you guys what, what some of the barriers you've experienced are. These were the ones that physicians talked about the most. Um, and balancing in-person and virtual is one of the things that people are really grappling with and how to, how to swing back wanting to take into account patient preference, but also recognizing that, you know, there are all kinds of, uh, I find it interesting, this isn't just for physicians, but most healthcare um, professions, regulations, leave it up to the clinician to determine if, uh, if standard of care can be met virtually. And that's a lot of pressure um, on the healthcare provider. So, so yes, we might have patients saying they wanna be seen that way or not seen that way, but how do we make the decision about whether, in this case, we can offer the same standard of care virtually? And this was some general guidance that they offered in light of this around when we go back to in-person from virtual. It's, and it's pretty, it's pretty bland. It's basically like follow public health, you know, do what you think is right. If by following public health, um, and there really hasn't been a lot of very specific guidance on how to uh, go back. And I think um, Mark, you showed this last session. Um, the the report that came out, or the advice that came out, a number of regulatory bodies got together and said, "You really have to get people back to in person." So now, thank you very much for seeing everybody by video, but now get back to in-person. And so I think a lot of people are feeling um, squeezed by that. So here is how we've started to think that through um, and in a very simple uh, way. Um, thanks to Chantel, she's on here, for her help with the, with the graphic that we started. Actually, she took the graphic and made it much better. <laughs> um, so how do we think about that? And this is a very simple approach that, um, and how do we go through and balance patient choice, so care, or case, sorry, case, not care. Um, uh, case, uh, how do we take each case one by one and think about balancing patient choice, whether the care is appropriate, whether it is safe and not just physically safe, um, but psychologically safe, culturally safe, and is overall the care that we're offering, um, is equity being addressed when we think about in-person versus virtual? So just take you through quickly a few questions that um, under each of those categories. So by choice, you know, what, what does the patient prefer? Um, and do they understand? Um, actually, I can't see all my slides. Hang on a second. I gotta move you guys. I was trying to watch all of you, but put you in the corner, there we go. Um, do they understand the relative risks and benefits of in-person versus virtual? So if you're seeing someone uh, for some kind of symptom, do they understand the risk of being seen virtually? Do they understand the risks of coming in in person? And do they consent? Do they have the capacity to consent to the modality that you're recommending? Is the care appropriate? So can you do the appropriate assessment or intervention virtually? Does it meet standard of care? And that's really the main question that regulatory bodies, that, like, that's your first question. Can you, can you meet an appropriate standard of care? Well, I would say, can the patient consent and can you meet the appropriate standard of care? Are the two key um, questions. And is virtual care a best practice for this population, this patient, this condition? Um, and you, you, but you'll find different lists everywhere. So I would still say the main questions are, can they consent and can you meet standard of care? And one, one way to ask this is how would this, what would a group of your peers say? You know, should you really be doing that laparoscopic surgery without training virtually? That's an extreme example. Uh, what would your peers have to say about that? Um, would most people, would it meet the standard of care that most people would, um, would deem appropriate? 
And then safety, um, is the client in a safe location to provide virtual care? So are they, are they driving? Uh, do they have privacy? Are they in an unsafe uh, situation? Um, and can you mitigate any safety risks? So we sometimes think about things like, um, especially suicidality um, is one that comes up for us a lot in mental health. And can you, can you manage those risks in a virtual environment? And uh, being trauma informed and culturally safe. So keeping that in mind, um, I've often been really struck by, you know, we have universal access to healthcare, but some communities really only get virtual care. And is that always meeting the needs, especially for special specialist care? Is that meeting the needs equally, um, which bring, will bring us into equity, but is that culturally safe for that person? And uh, so equity, are all choices available to all patients? And what are the barriers for particular patients and particular patient groups? And you mentioned a number of these um, in, in the barriers that you perceive in virtual care. And does the client have the knowledge and skills to access care virtually? And the way that we, this is very crude, but this is, they're not all equal. You know, um, I, I would say the red, the red lights really are around safety and appropriateness. Like if it's not appropriate for you to be providing that care, even if the client really, really wants it, um, that, that might be a dialogue with, with the client, but we can't provide care that we don't find appropriate or where we don't think we can manage the safety risks. It really enhances things if they would, uh, if they choose that care. And that might also be a conversation if they say, no, 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 I have to come in person. And you want to make sure they're weighing up all the options. That, that might be a conversation to see if you can expand their choices or help them think through um, some of the benefits of virtual or vice versa. And then equity um, really is something that, that uh, should guide us as we develop our, our clinics, our practices, our health systems, and uh, where we can also uh, intervene to try to improve the equity of the situation. So especially if we have a client who doesn't have, um, you know, very good technical skills or digital literacy, are there things that we can do if they don't have the equipment? Are there things we can do to make um, access more equitable? So that's a quick way, to, uh, a quick approach how we think about it and would love to to have a conversation about that and see if that's fitting with your experience.